You know, we just sang a song that we're not slaves to fear. We live in an interesting time, don't we? And uh, there's a lot of things that we can be anxious about right now, isn't there? And, uh, you know, we've made the decision as a church family to do two things. And I just want to remind you of that. And I want to call you to it and, and to live it. And then I want to pray as we get started here in God's Word in James chapter 2, if you have a Bible. Um, if you're on the uh, YouVersion Bible app, you can actually go under events and take some notes. There's uh, some pretty specific things that uh, I want to challenge you with this morning. But those two things that we've committed to as a church family are this, that we want to love our neighbor as ourself. And so no matter what we feel politically, or no matter what we feel about wearing a mask, or no matter what we feel about any of the issues that sit in front of every person in the world right now, or as a country, that we rise above that because the scripture, because God himself tells us that we are citizens of a different place. Can I get an amen in church? Can I get an amen online? I'm just going to trust you're doing it. Maybe throw it in the comments. But think about it, church. Redeemer City Church, we get to, in the middle of Tampa, be a part of this thing called the body of Christ. And it's a living thing. It's not a building. It's not a gathering. It's a people. It's a people who do those other things. And we want to love our neighbor as ourself. That, that's the people that call Redeemer home. But it's also the people that just live in our city and who are wandering like sheep without a shepherd. And we know the great and good shepherd, don't we? And so we, we talk about three things here. Love God, share good news, serve the city. And, and that's, that's the heartbeat of what we do. And so we want to live that, but how many of you know we need the Holy Spirit to be able to live that out, right? So let's pray. Let's ask God to help us with that. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to move into this space and meet with us just like Isaiah asked him to thousands of years ago, all right? Why don't you join me in prayer? God, thank you again for your goodness. We sing and declare with our mouth the truth that we don't have to be slaves to fear. But not just for any reason, but because we are children of God. Children of you, the Almighty. Father, we open your word in these moments, knowing that we need you to meet with us, that Holy Spirit, we need you to go before us. We need, as we began our service today, as we invited you into this place by reading from your word, it said that your word never comes back empty. It always accomplishes its purpose. And so I pray today that my voice would not be the center of attention, but that your word would be. And that Holy Spirit, you would do what you said was true in your word. Would we live that out with your power? We love you. It's in your strong name that we pray. Amen. James chapter 2, we're in the third part of a series on the book of James. And what we're unpacking is what it takes to make faith work. James often gets a bad rap that he is all about the gospel of works that it actually does take your effort and your involvement to be right with God and then to make God happy. But as we know, the thesis of the book, this won't be on the screen, I just want you to listen to it, or you can look at it in your Bible, really the thesis of the entire book of James, and I argued in week one of this series, the thesis of the entire Bible is found in James chapter 1, verse 18, 16, 17, and 18. And I want to read that as we get started. It says this, and I have this circled in red in my Bible. 
because this is incredibly important. The Bible says this, do not be deceived. You live in a cultural climate right now that would like to deceive you. There, there is an actual enemy, Ephesians tells us, named Satan, who is actively engaged in trying to bring you down spiritually. And he'll do whatever is necessary to make that happen. The Bible says this, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, so, so we're not actually wrestling against the Republicans. We're not actually wrestling against the Democrats. We're not actually wrestling against a people. We're wrestling, the Bible tells us, against the spiritual forces in this dark world. And so we take up the full armor of God. And we go on not just defense, but offense, because we have what is known as the sword of the Lord, the scripture, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so this is the place we come to, uh, as opposed to being fearful, we come back to the word. And so incredibly important as we think about that, do not be deceived. How do I not be deceived when there's so much information, so many opinions flying around our world? We go back to what God said. We go back to the book that's been around for thousands of years and has been tested and true and not proven wrong. Amen? So that's where we are. He says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. With everything changing, he does not change. Verse 18, I love this, of his own will. Not your effort, not my effort. The center, the focus of the Christian faith is not what you and I can do, but what Jesus has done, what he has decided. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so the rest of the book of James is what it looks like for grace to come into your life and then for you to live it out. Because we said in week one, when grace goes in, grace goes out. And that's what we believe, that as we turn our vision up and we love God because he first loved us, and then as he moves in and begins to share good news with us, we can begin to share good news with others. And then we can look with him, vision out, to serve our city. And so everything we believe is packed right there. And now we're getting to look at what it looks like to be a child of God, representing the family of God. As scripture says, we are ambassadors for his kingdom. So that's why we do what we do. And then last week, Pastor Jerome walked us through what it means to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. And so if you missed that, you can go back and check it out. But here we are in James chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And this is a scripture that is important for the moment that we find ourselves in, in our country. And I don't want to brush past that. This has applications far beyond that. And you need to know those and you need to live those. But I also want you to know that the Bible, though it is thousands of years old, is still 100% relevant to the things you are facing right now. To the things that you will face tomorrow to the things that you will face on November 3rd, all right? James chapter 2, verse number 1. My brothers, show no partiality. Let's pause. Partiality, some other versions are going to say favoritism, and we understand what that is, don't we? We, we live in that world, and uh, that, that's just part of our ethos. And let, let me give you an illustration. What's the best seat you've ever had? Just think about that. Like at a sporting event, you know, when we, when we go to a sporting event, we, I remember one time I was given uh, tickets, Kevin and I were, to go like have this experience 
at the Tampa Bay Rays, formerly known as the Devil Rays, and that's when it was. It was not when they were the Rays because, well, I'm older than I'd like to admit. But Kevin and I got these tickets where we got to go and like sit in the broadcast booth with like the two guys that are on the radio, or was it TV? I can't remember. I think it was radio. They were scared that Kevin and I would do something stupid. And so radio, right? We have a radio, radio face, I guess. And so that, that was like one of the best seats I'd ever had at a sporting event, right? Because it's a totally different vantage point and, and it took something else to get me there. I think it was like a fundraiser or something. And, and, and it was just, it was like an incredible experience. So, so best seat. Also like, what's the worst seat you've ever had at a place? What's the worst seat? I remember I went to um, a football game one time with my dad and the way that the stadium was structured, I was right behind a pillar. And I'm like, okay, I, we, like, we bought these tickets. It wasn't like they were given, like, and post, right? And so we had to stand and move and, you know, it was like the worst seat I've ever had. But let me ask you this, as you think about that, what would happen if when you showed up here at Redeemer City Church, we stopped you at the door and said, uh, do you have a ticket? And you were like, a ticket? No. Like, what do you mean a ticket? Well, you know, you have to go online and you have to get on Ticketmaster and find Redeemer City Church and you have to buy a ticket. You have to buy a ticket. And you would be like, that's not okay, right? Right? That's not okay, because what, what do we understand about church? It's open. It's free. It's the body. It's not the building. It's all those things. And so we, we would understand the offense that was there. But look at what James does here. He, he goes and he comes to the people of God in this early church, and he brings them that kind of encouragement. And I want you to see how it connects to where we are. So my brothers and sisters, show no favoritism or show no partiality as you do what? As you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and I love this phrase, the Lord of glory. It's a great phrase. He's a powerful God. Verse 2, for if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, all right, the gathered church, what we're doing right now, if somebody comes in wearing fine clothing and uh, a sh poor man comes in in shabby clothing, verse 3, if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? One of the things we talk about a lot at Redeemer City Church is the gospel levels the playing field. Because when God's law is held up in front of you, we are all the same. We have fallen short of the glory of God, right? It says the Lord of glory. And Romans tells us that when we are in face-to-face -face communication with the law of God, called the law of liberty in a second here, that we become exposed. We, we recognize who we are and everybody is in the same place. And so you've made distinctions, verse 4, James says. And then verse 5, listen, my beloved brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who Love him, but you have dishonored the poor. You've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? Remember, they lived in a different time than we do. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called. Remember back to the thesis statement of the book, that of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. He called us. He made the first move. It's one way love comes from the father of lights to his kids, the poor in spirit as scripture 
calls, right? That's Matthew chapter five, blessed are the poor in spirit. So this is where we're at. Verse eight, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality or favoritism, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. It's like if you have a sheet of glass and you shatter one corner, it is a useless piece of glass, right? Think about it. If you break one part of the glass, all the glass is useless. If you break one law, you have broken the law and are falling short of God's glory. And so that's all of us. That was you yesterday. Come on, those of you with kids, that was you this morning, amen? As you uh, happily dressed them, fed them, you know, hugged your wife and husband. That's not always the case, is it? Where are the parents at? We know. <laughs> we break the law. We're, we're all sinners, Right, and you know, maybe you're not a Christian today and that's offensive to you. Sorry, but join the party. Join the party. If, if we were to follow any of each other around for a day, we wouldn't have to do it for a week, maybe just a couple hours, we would realize that we're all sinners. We're all on the same playing field of life. It's who we are. And so then it comes to this in verse 11. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you, have, if you commit adultery, but do, if you do not commit adultery, but commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. And then here's where we'll spend a lot of our time today. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy is triumphs over judgment. You see, one of the things that is brought up frequently to sort of counteract or, you know, accuse Christians who are a little too heavy on grace is, well, what about all the stuff we're supposed to do? <laughs> I mean, if you read the Bible, there's a lot of stuff we're supposed to do and there's a lot of stuff we're supposed to not do. But there are important avenues in which we come to those things, right? Because Romans tells us that it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. And here we say, you see, mercy triumphs over judgment. And yet the verse before says, There's no, there is judgment without mercy for one who shows no mercy. And so what does all this have to do with you? And why did I say that it has to do with you today and tomorrow and November 3rd? What is all that about? I want to walk you through just a really quick outline of this text. And then we're going to land in a place where you and I, and those of you watching online, where we're, frankly, we're going to need to spend some time in prayer. And so we're going to take like two minutes. Don't get too nervous. All right. But we're going to take like two minutes and Kevin's just going to play behind us as we spend some time with the Lord. Because I really believe that, not yet. I told him I was going to call him up, and that was really close. <laughs> I need a little more time, Kevin. But I want you to think about this passage in three different terms. Okay, If you're taking notes on the YouVersion Bible app, you'll see these terms here. But if you're just writing, let me give them to you. I want to start by looking at the goal. And then I want to move to, you don't have to put these up yet. Don't let the cat out of the bag. All right? But the goal of what this text is saying. And then I want to look at the, what, what uh, theologians call the malady or the problem. So goal, malady, or what's, what's God asking of us? What's the problem with what he's asking for us? And then we want to land in this place of the means. In other words, how do, we, how do we get that? How do we accomplish that? And so we're going to look at the goal, the malady, and the means from this passage. So what is the goal of what James is telling us here? 
What's the goal for a follower of Jesus, both in his time period and ours? There, there's some real similarities here. While we're not oppressed in the same way that they were oppressed, we as a culture are rapidly approaching the place where it's no longer socially acceptable for you to be a Christian. That the things that God wrote in his book are now countercultural to what our society is going to present as the best way for you to live. And you should just know that. And what James lays out here is two goals for us out of this text. He's, he says, show no partiality. So the first goal that he gives us here is to show no favoritism. Or just simply, no favorites. You can put that up on the screen, right? What's the goal of what we're doing here? No favorites. No favorites. And, and while you're thinking about no favorites, there's some things that we have to listen to and learn from, right? Because what happens here is James says, don't show partiality or don't play favorites, but then he shows us why. He teaches us something. He brings our vision up. He teaches us something about who God is, and if we are his kids, his representatives, his ambassadors, Genesis tells us we're made in his image. We literally reflect who God is. It's important for us to know how God operates, right? Because if we're told to show no favorites, as we hold our faith in the Lord of glory, that has to begin to change some things about the way he works through us. And so what are we told to listen and learn? We're told a few things about God. We're told that God chooses the poor. This is incredibly countercultural. You see, because it's incredibly important for you and I to recognize that God is bringing to the table some alternate values in the kingdom of God because, listen to me, if you get nothing else out of today, you should at least get this from the character of God when it says that he chooses the poor, that we are firstly Christians, follower of Jesus, and we're Americans second. I'm not saying that none of those things that are happening in our culture are important. I'm not saying that I don't have opinions, because I do. But what I am saying is that no matter what happens on November 3rd, as a Christian, you can have joy. Because here's what I know. Whoever wins on November 3rd, Jesus is still the king. Jesus is still, what is it? The Lord of glory. And so it really doesn't, in one sense, it doesn't matter who wins. But I also get that it matters. But, but, what, but what I'm afraid of is that as Christians, we get our priorities out of whack because we're spending all of our time in this country instead of all of our, a lot of our time in his kingdom. And that's important because that's where the connection to last week comes in. Because for you to be able to do the word, for you to be able to live the word, you have to know the word, right? Know the word, do the word. Before your vision goes up and you fall in love with Jesus and he comes in and shares good news with you so that you can experience complete joy from abiding in him, you are not going to be able to step out into the world and live in the fullness of joy looking at what's going on. You're just not going to. If we care about any of the things that are being pumped out right now, our health, our financial well-being, and we, we could just go on and on and on, and that's not my point today, but if any of those things are more important than the Lord of glory, you are not going to be satisfied in this life. You won't be. You weren't designed to be. Our vision has to go up, and so it's showing us something about the kingdom of God, about the character of God. It says that he chooses the poor, but he doesn't just choose the poor for the heck of it. What does he say? He says, I choose the poor to be rich. I choose the poor to be rich. To be rich in what? In faith. 
And as you, the poor in spirit, are chosen by God to be rich in faith, you are an heir to the kingdom of God. So where, where, do, where does my ability to not be a slave to fear, whatever that is for you, it's going to be different for every single one of us. Maybe it has nothing to do with the things that are going on in the world, but there's something going on in your life personally. Something was done to you or something is happening around you or whatever the circumstance may be. I don't know what it is for you. But how do you get to the place where you no longer are a slave to fear? It comes from this place, knowing that God has chosen you to be rich in faith and an heir to the kingdom of God. If I know those things to be true, then it doesn't really matter what happens to me. We still live with wisdom. Proverbs is still in the Bible. It's it's not like we make rash, stupid decisions. However, we make decisions in faith knowing that we have a God who sits above all of it, the Lord of glory, and he's made you an heir to his kingdom, which will far outlast this kingdom. And we have to have that eternal perspective or we will not do well in our temporary perspective. We can't. And so that's the goal, right? The goal is for you to get to a place where you live in complete peace, shalom, fullness, wholeness, fine with whatever circumstantially is going on because you're an heir to the kingdom of God, because you're a child of God. And when you're a child of God, an heir to the kingdom, and you have an altogether different view of what this world is and where you're headed with Jesus, you are able to then live differently. You can live altogether different from the world, right? And so a lot of times we look at a lot of these little external things. This is the way Christians ought to be separate and different, whether it be your hairstyle or what you eat or drink or what, like all these things. And and I would just suggest to you that that's not what it means to be different as a Christian. Your hairstyle and your clothing style can be just like the world's, And you are going to look really different as a Christian for these reasons. Because in the culture that we live, as divided as it is, what will make you stand out? Not how you dress, but how you live. The choices you make in the kingdom of God, because God's bringing his kingdom on earth just as it is in heaven. That's how he taught us to pray. And so it's going to be the ethics of living in the kingdom over everything that will make you different. It's a united church, John 17, that will make the world turn and look. That when our whole country is divided, that our church is not. And what does that mean? That means a whole lot of dying to self. So that's the goal. But how many of you know there's a problem? <laughs> There's always a malady. There's always a problem when we get the goal laid out in Scripture, right? Because the goal, God's ideal, is always outside of what you can accomplish on your own. It's always outside of what you can muster up the courage, that you can muster up the strength or the ability to do. It will always be that way and for a very good reason. But look at the problem here. It says you have to fulfill the royal law. Why is it royal? Because we have a Lord of glory. We have a king and his name's Jesus. And so what does it look like to fulfill not just the law? Because here's the reality. You and I on the surface can probably keep a list of rules. On the, on the outside, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we can keep a list of rules, can't we? We can get a to-do list and we can make sure those things happen. But that's not what the royal law is because Jesus took it a step farther. It's not just don't murder. It's not just don't commit adultery, right? It goes beyond that to your heart. James presents it this way, love your neighbor as yourself. How's that going? How how will that affect you on November 4th? Because 
Hopefully you'll do your civic duty on November 3rd. You'll do the research, you'll pray, you'll ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in that way as you vote. But what happens on November 4th? Or maybe, let's be honest, maybe like November 10th by the time they do all the recounts and whatnot. <laughs> How will you be shaped by the kingdom of God on November 10th? Knowing that you are an heir to a kingdom that is not of this world. Love your neighbor as yourself. But then it's called this, the law of liberty. Why? Why is it called the law of liberty? How, how is a law liberating? Because God's law is liberating, right? Because every single time you are presented in Scripture that you don't and cannot keep this law. You ought to try, don't get me wrong. But you're a sinner. You're a sinner. And as, as much as you try, you are going to have days where you drop the ball, where you fumble the football. <laughs> Daily, you're going to, maybe not physically, maybe you're good at keeping the rules, but what about in your mind, in your heart, in your soul? What about your thoughts? We're transgressors. We're lawbreakers. And so there's this goal that we will live with a totally different mindset as heirs of the kingdom, as poor in spirit, and as people who are to love our neighbor as ourself. But you and I recognize, and if we just look through the past few days, we realize that we aren't and can't totally keep that law. So what do we do with that? And this is the place that I want to land with you today before we spend some time praying. What do we do with that? What, what is the means then to us doing the thing that God's called us to do? How do we do that? I love this in verse 12. He says all those things and then he drops this. He says, so, right? I mean, when I talk to my kids, we'll like spout a bunch of stuff and then be like, so, and then the thing we actually want to say happens, <laughs> right? And so here, here James, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, brings it all down to a simple thing. He says this, with all that in mind, the kingdom you're living in, the kingdom you're an heir to, love your neighbor as yourself. So what does that mean? Speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Speak as one set free undeservedly. Act as one set free undeservedly because mercy triumphs over judgment. What does that have to do with you on tomorrow, on November 10th? What does that have to do? Listen, it's really tempting right now to look at other people and if they don't believe exactly what you believed, believe to judge them without mercy. No matter how strongly you hold to a certain viewpoint, the Bible lays out that you ought to speak and act as one who has been set free undeservedly I'm not saying don't have a debate I'm not saying don't share your viewpoint I'm not saying any of that but what I am saying is that the scripture lays out that we have to rise to a different place because we've been set free undeservedly so no matter how wrong that person is you know that you have been set free from your issues as well. That when God looked at you, he gave you mercy when you deserved judgment. And in this moment, to love your neighbor as yourself means to speak and act as one who has been set free undeservedly. Why? Because mercy triumphs over judgment. Let me say it to you this way. Who am I? Who am I 
to judge somebody else. Knowing what God has been merciful to me about. Knowing what God's been merciful to you about. Who are we to judge somebody else? I love the way the Apostle Paul tells his friends in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. This won't be on the screen, but you can look it up later. I just love the phrase he says, but for the grace of God, I am who I am. What's he saying there? I, I, am, I have got all the problems, but because of the grace of God, I am who I am. And that's the story for you and I. If it wasn't for God's grace, man, who would we be? What kind of hope would we have? Just look around. You would see your options for hope. And they ain't good. When it comes to the ultimate hope that we have, our hope is that we are heirs to the kingdom of God. We are poor in spirit. And so we speak and act as those who have been set free by the Lord of glory because his mercy triumphs over his judgment. Amen? Kevin's going to come up and he's going he's to play. And after a minute or two, you can come up. After a minute or two, he's just going to lead us in a hymn because there's something powerful about our response to the things that God's doing. That as our vision goes up and then he moves in and he starts to rearrange things, because I don't know about you, but if I'm going to speak and act as one who's been given mercy by the Lord of glory, there are some things that need to change. There's some some thoughts, some judgments that I make towards other people on a daily basis that need to change because we have to start seeing people the way God sees them as objects of his mercy, as people who bear his image. And so here's what I want to do, whether you're in the room or whether you're watching online, I just want, as the music plays... I just want you to sit with that. I just want you to sit with verse 12. Knowing that on your own power, you will not pull that off. I will not pull that off. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that the Holy Spirit will come upon you with power to be his witness. And that's what this world needs from the church right now. We need a people of God filled with the Spirit of God on mission with God. We need people who love God. We need people who bring and experience good news. And we need a church that's going to go serve our city because mercy triumphs over judgment.